Um, okay, we're going to agenda item number two is the adoption of the January 10th meeting minutes. Has everybody had a chance to go ahead and review some minutes? Is there any requested changes to the minutes? Okay. Um, There's no changes. I move we accept the minutes as written. Thank you. Somebody second that? Somebody second that? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, with that, we'll go ahead and adopt the January 10th, 2019 meeting minutes. Okay, um, we have on the agenda as our next item the uh, vote on the bylaws. The bylaws um, are not going to be changing, so that's not going to be necessary um, from the last time we voted, but Kristen has a comment that she'd like to make to the bylaws, um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her. Um, yes, so we were, uh, Dr. Garcia checked in with the uh, county attorney on the bylaws, and the bylaws that we voted on in December will stand, which means that when we have subcommittee meetings with a, um, with a quorum of subcommittee members, so that's not a full quorum, but a quorum from the subcommittee, when we have those meetings, um, we will publicly post those. But it will be up to the subcommittees if they meet on that Thursday or they meet other times. But we will create agendas and we will post those, so it will be public meetings. Um, but we've already voted on those bylaws, so we don't have to, the good news is we don't have to make any changes tonight um, to what we've already voted on. Okay, any comments, or discussion on that? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then. Um, the next order is the call to the audience. We have a full house and I have a full stack of um, people that like to get up and speak. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and remind everybody that we need to keep it to three minutes. Um, like I said, we do have quite a few people that, that wanna get up and speak. We wanna make sure we get to everybody um, and everybody gets a chance. Um, I believe we took these in the order that they came in. So um, we're going to just start with number one, and if I mispronounce your, your last name or your first name, I apologize up front. Um, Gail? Is it Spar? Spar. Spar, thank you. My name is Gail Spar, and I am reading for Christy Hollinger of Terry Drive. Until recently, I was unaware that PAC had a policy of adopting dogs to people who live homeless. Through advocacy, I've met dogs and their people in our homeless community. I have experiences to share. I stopped to help a man and his just adopted dog walking down Silverbell in 108 degree temps. The dog was wearing a cone and was in distress. I offered them water, they had none, and arrived back to the shelter. The staff agreed to let Buddy stay a few days to recover from surgery. I drove the man to his camp, Buddy was diagnosed with valley fever. That week, a uh, dog named Adler adopted from Maricopa died of heat exhaustion after walking four miles. Vinny was lost by his adopter. I helped search for him for weeks as he was literally passed around the homeless community, used for panhandling and bribes. What I saw during that experience was disturbing. Drugs, abuse, not safe for a dog or a child. Blue is a pack dog, a gentle giant, with a history of dog fights and severe allergies. He had swollen raw feet, difficulty walking even short distances. His meds cost more than $100 a month. Yet Blue was adopted to Joe, a man who lives homeless and walks 10 miles a day. When volunteers checked on Blue, his feet were bleeding. He was reacting to dogs and almost bolted across the busy street to one. Pack had given some meds to Joe, but he had no plan after that. I offered to pay for a vet visit. Volunteers provided food and support. Joe found after a few days that he could not manage Blue. He could not reach Pack, so he called me for a ride to choose a new dog. He lost Blue's meds. Joe adopted Mallory and called me several times for help. Volunteers assisted with supplies when his was stolen. Mallory was very strong and a small dog reacted. Again, Joe called and said he could not reach Pat but needed to give her up. He had no one to watch her when he needed to shop and get medical care. Friends didn't show up. He, called, he caught a stranger mistreating her. I tried to reach Pat for him but I got no response so volunteers gave him a, Mallory a ride to Pat then to his doctor. Joe said it was well known that homeless folks could get free dogs and supplies from Pack. I trust he had good intentions, but misjudged the challenges of owning a dog while homeless. The environment is harsh. Not everyone is as responsible as the feel-good stories we are told. There is another side. Many do not have people to help them with their pets. Pack does not have the infrastructure and outreach even to answer the phone 
to provide the kind of support that folks like Joe need to care for a dog. Therefore, we must seconds. consider adopting to them at this time. A monthly outreach event is not enough. Would these dogs have gotten the care they need or would have suffered and died from untreated medical conditions, get hit by a car or put down after going after another animal? We must consider these risks and do our best to provide responsible, safe placement for our dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Gail, before you go, you said that was from Christy Hollinger? Yes. Okay, great. Just making sure. <laughs> now everybody knows what that sounds like. <laughs> um, Cheryl Vanden... Charlie Vandenberg. Charlie Vandenberg. Sorry about that. <laughs> My name is Charlie Vandenberg and I live on West San Juan Terrace in Tucson. I'm reading this for Kyla Ballesteros, a pet volunteer and medical practitioner who was unable to attend. Dog ownership is a privilege, not a right. I am in full support of providing assistance to those that need help caring for their animals, but placing animals in a potentially harmful situation is a different story. Recently, I witnessed a man panhandling at a street corner with a dog while I was at work. I could see through the window that the man was shaking and choking the terrified dog. Many cars passed by and did nothing. I pleaded with the man to stop hurting his dog, who appeared very fearful of this person. He came in the building, left, and moved on with his dog. Later that night, the man and dog were seen again down the street. Terrified for the dog's safety, the concerned citizen offered money in exchange for the dog. The man freely gave up the dog at the sight of cash. I soon discovered this dog was adopted from Peck. His name is Chili. He was known to be skittish on his walks, had a history of fearfulness, and on his last adoption, where he was kept outside of a camper with no utilities and a small kennel run, he escaped the run and was lost in the desert for days. At the request of the adopter and PEC staff, a volunteer responded and rescued him. The owner returned him. Chili was obviously not an ideal dog for a homeless man frequenting busy streets. It was discovered that the man that adopted Chili had documented complaints to Peg of abusing his previous dog named Roadkill, who had been in and out of Peg each time this man lost him. Rody, who Peg renamed, was even delivered back to the man's homeless camp by our protection officers. Yet despite the complaints, Chili was still adopted to him. A simple records search shows this man is a felon with convictions of child abuse, which he served a year in prison for. This was clear, very clearly an adoption that should have never occurred. Thankfully, immediate help was available for Chile from community citizens. Peck was not there to help or support him. His collar, harness, and leash were so tightly intertwined, they had to be cut off. Chile was shaking, filthy, scared, incredibly hungry and thirsty. This dog was knowingly placed into a very unhealthy and dangerous living situation that could have been avoided completely. Why are we placing dogs into the hands of known dangerous people? Why are we willing to trade the life of a dog for a statistical improvement? What would have happened to Chile? What happens to so many dogs placed into the hands of people that view dog ownership as a right and not a privilege? These are not questions we should have to be pondering in the first place. I respectfully request that this statement in its entirety will be added to the minutes of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Cindy? Is it Kerlin? I said two Thank you. Our community has spoken. They said yes. They said yes to a new shelter and a tax hike that came with it. They said yes so that the homeless animals living on our streets have a safe haven to spend their days while waiting for a new living home. A safe haven that will provide shelter from the harsh desert elements, I'm sorry, let me do that, for belly so they never feel hungry and receive necessary medical care when needed. Our community has a force of good Samaritans watching over the homeless animals. They're on our streets. Oh my God. <laughs> so sorry. Then you go to work late or miss a commitment because they found a stray dog while heading to their destination. Instead of driving by hoping for the best, they stop and do whatever is needed to get that dog off of the street and into the into a safe place. Oftentimes, this can take many hours out of a busy day. For those of us who use social media, the stories are endless. The stories are the same over and over again. I guess Samaritan is spending their time and financial resources. I'm so sorry to try and be friends with their dog that has been hanging out in the neighborhood or hanging out in the desert or maybe on the trail they go hiking on. 
They spend days, sometimes weeks or months, to gain the dog's trust and get them to safety. For those of us who have lived this, we know how emotionally draining it is. Thank you. How defeating it can be. But the day it finally happens and the dog is safe at the beautiful shelter that they helped build with an animal-loving staff and volunteers that will do everything they can to make sure that dog will never be in harm's way again. The tears of happiness come, the feeling of pride and joy take over knowing that you just saved a life. He is in good hands and now has a second chance at the life he deserves. Do you think the good Samaritans in our community would have said yes if they knew that Pat would willingly put a dog back out on the street? Thank you. Joe? Is it Wishini? Wishini. Wishini. Thank you, Joe. I'm speaking today as a voting resident of Pima County as well as a volunteer at PAC. Um, as you know, the citizens of Pima County voted yes for a $22 million bond to build a better facility for the pets in our community. No more overcrowding, no more overflow tent, freezing cold in the winter, stiflingly hot in the summer, nothing but the best for our animals. What do you think will happen if the public learns that PAC is giving the dogs they trusted you with, the dogs they trusted you with, to homeless people? I think they'd be horrified. I spent a lot of time talking to people about how things are better at PAC and that it's safe to bring animals into our shelter if they must. They can trust PAC to do its best for them. The community trusts PAC to do right. Animals arrive at PAC for a variety of reasons, but the vast majority of them have lived in a home, inside, in a loving home. Folks who can no longer care for their pets, owners who go into assisted living, owners get sick, owners die, they all trust us to find their dogs a good home. Even stray dogs have mostly come from a home at some point. They got lost or they got dumped, but they came from a home. You can tell from their condition. Our community expects that these animals will find another home, not be forced to live on the street winter or summer, walking miles every day. Summers in Tucson are brutal. We have between 60 and 90 days a year with temperatures over 100 degrees, and probably just as many between 90 and 100 degrees. This climate is not friendly to dogs living outside. I sympathize with the struggles of homeless people, and I am not judging them. For whatever reason, they are in a tough place. I applaud the programs PAC has created to support these folks, whether persons without a home or those on the edge of poverty who already have pets. But that does not mean PAC should be giving new dogs to homeless folks who don't have one. That is not part of PAC's mission. PAC's mission is to care for animals that come to us and find them new suitable homes. Life on the street is not a suitable home. The law in Pima County is that dogs must have shelter, food, and water. Where is the shelter for people without homes? There are people facing homelessness that actually come to us to relinquish their pets. They are, uh, they are losing their homes or being evicted and have to move in with friends or family and cannot bring their animals with them. 30 seconds. They trust us with their beloved pets, sobbing as they hand them over to us, trusting us to find them another home where they will be cared for. Can you imagine how they would feel if they knew that you had put their dogs out on the street to live? That's not what PAC is here for. I implore you to stop this foolish idea that any part of our mission is intentionally sentencing our dogs to life on the street. That's not a brilliant idea, and it's not a great conversation. It's irresponsible. I respectfully request that my statement be made part of the public. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Kathy Newman. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Newman. I've been volunteering at PAC for nine years. Several years ago, many volunteers were asked to collaborate with PAC on a new adoption policy. And I believe the approved mission statement that came out of this policy says it all. The fundamental objective of PAC is to find homes in which each animal may live out the rest of its life, free from harm, with adequate food, water, exercise, protection from the elements, quality veterinary care, and frequent and positive interactions with human beings. 
Volunteers later developed tools to help achieve this mission, and these included an approved adoption application, a customer handout, and a communication checklist. These were never implemented, but I have copies with me if anyone would ever care to see them. Being an adoption counselor is extremely difficult and one of the most challenging roles you'll find at PAC. If you ask most volunteers, you'll find they don't want to ever perform this duty, and why? I'll tell you, after serving in this capacity for over four years, I have some thoughts I'd like to share. PAC often has those customers who we start talking to, we get to meet them, and then we know in our hearts they're not good candidates for a pet. We're told there's no policy to stop this, to deny them. We need to be able to say no. And we need management to trust us and support our decision to do so. The adoption process often becomes the only opportunity we ever get to educate the public on how to care for a pet. Education is certainly necessary. However, customers should be educated prior to adoption. I believe maybe they should watch some videos and have some handouts. Conversation-based interviews should be happening with customers. But adopters Adoption counselors need more time to do this. Adoption should never be easy, and they should never be rushed. PAC needs more adoption staff to accomplish this, and perhaps the communication checklist I talked about earlier should be implemented. And no adoption should ever be an at-risk adoption. PAC should require proof of residency, perform background checks, and adhere to a do not adopt list. I feel a more detailed application should also be used. There will always be the argument that if we deny adoptions, customers will just go elsewhere, and this may be true, but we can't control the rest of the world. We can control what happens to our pets here at PAC. And there will always be arguments about best practices at other successful agencies, and that's fine and good. However, we are a county shelter achieving all-time record highs unprecedented standards are being set here. We're the role model. We should never send a pet to a life on the street. We should never send it to any questionable adoption. These pets trust us and they rely on us to make the highest quality decisions we can for them. Their fate is in our hands and I for one never want to look into a pet's eyes as they leave us knowing I didn't do my very best to find them the best possible life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie Clark. Sorry. 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 Part. I live in the city, I work for the city, sorry I don't have anything prepared, I just kind of want to speak on a little bit of what they all touched on. So I work for the city of Tucson, I work as a firefighter, and I also work as an emergency room nurse. So I see the public in a lot different perspective than a lot of other people do. Um, in regards to the letter that was read about Chile that was found at Broadway and Craycroft, um, I was aware of that situation because I help a lot in the city trying to find lost dogs, a lot of them end up being newly adopted packs. So I'm out a lot trying to rescue these dogs that get away from their owners. In Chile, probably one of the most disturbing things and something I personally see all the time happen is these, a lot of these homeless are willing to give up these animals in exchange for money. And that's what happened in this case. A good Samaritan, you know, once we saw that this dog clearly wasn't, didn't, wasn't comfortable with this person, handed him over for who knows what they're going to do with that money. So I kind of want to just shed a little bit of light on my profession. We respond to homeless every day, all day long. I work at every station in town and we respond to homeless all the time. One of the issues we come across is when we do have pets. We can't transport pets in our medic trucks. We can't do anything with the pets, but the burden ends up back on pack and ultimately on the dogs. If they come back to get them, most likely they probably don't. I've also been on the other end of it working in the emergency room where are taking people in and we end up with a dog and we end up having to take it back to pack. It just 
it puts an unneeded burden out in the city when you're adopting a dog out or cat, you know, out to somebody who, who doesn't have a home, who doesn't have a residence. It puts a burden on us as a community trying to help them and also trying to help their pet. Um, since I've been in, personally in the situation where I drove a lady's van to UMC because she had her small dog in there. Pat couldn't respond. She needed to go to the hospital and it was the middle of the summer and it wasn't going to be a dog sitting in a van. She had nobody that she, she was living in a, in a van. Um, so these situations happen probably more than anybody knows and I actually just want to shed some light on that and you know make you guys aware whether you hear you know from the city or that you know that we're calling Pat all the time for these kind of things. It, it's a, it's a big, it's a big issue. Um, we see it nonstop. We just want to make sure you guys are aware of the potentially dangerous situation that animals are being put in on the corners and with nowhere to go at night. Because we've had dogs that we have found roaming around. We know they belong for other people in the area. Oh, I've seen that guy with it. They don't want him back. You know, now we're creating traffic hazards and stuff. More trying to catch so I personally, because I, I'm living doing this as my job every day, just want to make sure you guys are aware of the situation, how it should exist out in the city. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, sir. That is perspective. Yeah, yeah. Sure. thank you so thank much. You sure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Marcy? Is it Boleen? Ballon. Ballon, thank you. We'll change of pace. I want to go speak to the new procedure. Um, I wasn't here last month, which is unusual. Um, and on the agenda was a um, call to the audience procedure. And what happened at the meeting was a very detailed procedure that was voted on and passed. And of course, the call to the audience is before the details, unless I missed something from somewhere. Um, it wasn't clear what was going to be discussed or what was included in the protocol that was going to be set. So in essence, you preclude having any input from the community to what is going to be discussed and voted on later in the meeting. And I noticed again today it's on the agenda. I don't know if that was a mistake or it says new business call to the audience procedure again. So it, I would just ideally like to see that um, if something is going to be voted on and there's details about what will be voted on at that meeting, that that somehow be made public so that if people wanted to come and speak to it on the agenda, that's the purpose of the public notice. They could come and speak. All these people are here because they knew what was going to be on the agenda. They helped get it on the agenda, so they could speak to it specifically. But if you don't know what's going to be there, you, you can't have input. I think one of the things, um, the only thing that was addressed, I think Jane spoke in the minutes, because we knew that there was a change of only one call to the audience, and it was going to be at the beginning of the meeting. And, um, that's been happening for months, so that was something that was addressed in that call to the audience. But the, the comments about the priority, um, there was a comment about um, if time allows, and that you, know, you had the right to, you had the ability to extend the time allotted, but it never said, at least not in minutes, what is the time allotted? So I was greatly pleased to see that you said we want to get everybody in today, but the way that was written, it was that it could be called off at any time. We only allowed 10 minutes and we're not having any more speak, and here's the order we're going to call them, and if you're at the cutoff point, you're cut off. So I just wanted to say that that seemed awkward, and if the time allotted will always accommodate, there's an important issue that the community's coming forward to talk about. Yeah, we'll use that. But, so I just want to say again, I don't know what the comments are today, so I can't speak to them, but it would be nice to know if something's going to be voted on, especially something like call to the audience that affects the public so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. And Jane. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm Jane Schwerin. I'm president of People for Animals. <clears throat> and I agree with everything that that all of the speakers have said about the disposition of animals. Not, uh, I, they emphasized how bad it is to give adopt animals out to people on the streets, but also 
can be bad, and, and I know all of, you, all of you said that it can also be bad to adopt animals to, in other bad situations also. And so one of the worst is to people who don't have the, enough uh, money to pay for veterinary bills if, when, if something unexpected comes up. Sometimes they think that they've got enough money to feed and shelter and, but the, and the, the animals. But if, if the dog is hit by a car and then they have a broken bone to contend with, it's unexpected, and then, so then they don't have, they don't have any money to to take care of those animals. And um, I, I hope everybody knows here that it is the law that they have to dispose of animals humanely. It's, it's not only what we all uh, wish from the bottom of our hearts, but it also is the law. The law in both the city and the county says that any, any animals adopted have to be placed by adoption in a suitable home. I realize sometimes it's hard to tell what's suitable, but so, you can certainly tell what's not suitable. In the, in, the, in the examples that all of the speakers have given here today, about these homeless people that would, would obviously had no shelter of any kind, that could be known that, they, that it was not a suitable home. So the law says if they're adopted, both city and county, placed by adoption only in a suitable home. And then the, the other point that I would like to tell you, just to make sure that you got it, uh, when Ms. Auerbach did mention it briefly, but it has been very important and has been the subject of much debate uh, back and forth about whether whether the subcommittees should be open to the public. And I have here a ruling from the county attorney saying that they sh the subcommittees must be open to the public. Mm -hmm. And also he says about the, the um, uh, let's see, let me read the subcommittees from, from the original committee are subject to open meeting laws which require public notification and posted signs. That is from the county attorney. Jane, I hate to interrupt you, but it's been three minutes and we have already, you may have missed it, but we already talked about that with um, the agenda item on the bylaws where we did say that we were going to be publicly noticing all of the subcommittees. So we have actually already covered that this morning, or sorry, this afternoon um, earlier. So I thank you very much for coming and for speaking. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak at the call to the audience? Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for talking. We appreciate it. I tried to that as a courtesy, but thank you, Jane. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the next uh, item on the agenda is item number four, and that is the standing items. We have the director's communication and monthly report. And I will go ahead and turn that over to Kristen. Uh, thanks everyone. Sorry about how late this report came out. It was our first report detailing two months. So the numbers look a little bit differently. I'm not sure how we're going to do this moving forward since I, we gave you the each month data summary so you can see it broken out, uh, but then we brought it together for, uh, for this. Um, I think this has been like a, a two months of real new collaborative efforts and not all of it's mentioned in here, but we're working um, more closely with the Hermitage on getting ready for kitten season 2019. Um, the kittens are coming. Uh, and we're, we're, Karen's team has been great and we're trying to get queens and babies to them quickly. Um, and we're gonna be working out the kinks on that, but uh, we're really excited for that partnership to expand. Um, I have to give a shout out to Tucson Cares um, and Jessica Schumann's group. 
who have just been kind of, as you know, Jessica is relentless. She will tell you that herself, but um, they have been just doing a marvelous effort of saving some of the more at-risk cats um, and pushing us to develop protocols and procedures to develop those. So that's been great. And also, no, no kill Pima County. Marcy Vellin did a lot of the original training on the Pet Support Center, and she's come back, volunteered her time to do training with our intake staff. Uh, and we're, she's offered some retraining for them on resources we can offer people who aren't sure how they can keep their pets. So resources on housing, everything from housing to spay and neuter uh, is training our new staff. And we've also had some, some volunteers training them on kitten, how to help people keep kittens in the community. Because most people don't realize that it is, they think they see a baby kitten, litter baby kittens, they're supposed to pick them up and bring them to us. But if, those, if the mom is caring for those kittens, they have a much higher chance of survival if they stay where they are. And in fact, our, um, our, kitten, our tiny kitten death rate last year was um, higher than it should have been because people were bringing us day-old kittens and they're almost impossible to have them survive. I mean, we have many fosters who want to try, but it's really hard. So we're going to be amping up our communications efforts this year on if they're teeny tiny kittens and you know mom is around, leave them alone until they're old enough and we can either get them TNR'd or if they're friendly uh, cats, we can bring them in and, and get them adopted. So um, so that's been a, a, it's been a really good couple of months. We've had time to do some strategic work and I could name 10 other partners we've worked with like that. But if you look at our metrics last year, the biggest increase was in kittens. Everything else in Pima County is staying steady or going down. The kittens went up by almost 900, and so we're, we're really focused on keeping that population um, down as much as possible so that we can serve them. We just couldn't keep up with the volume of tiny kittens coming in last year. Um, we are... bringing on a ton of new people. No, that's not true. Over the past year, we've brought in on, in on a ton of new folks. We've had a lot of new people coming in, and they're fulfilling specific roles. So like, we had this critical cat care specialist. We got someone who's a true critical cat care expert. Um, we needed a cat foster coordinator. We brought in a cat foster coordination expert. So um, a lot of new faces you'll see around PAC, but I think what's exciting about it, and why I wanted to mention it, is that there are a lot of new faces, but a lot of them have very specific skill sets, and that's exciting. I think we're at a point where we're attracting people who have those skill sets, and they are so darn hard to come by. And that includes two vets who we have, one we have hired, and one we have almost hired. Um, so we should be fully stepped on vets, stepped on vets by this early this summer. Um, thank goodness. So uh, that is, that's about it. We're just... Rocking and rolling, getting ready for our busy season. We have 67 cats on site today, which is some kind of record. Um, in about two months, we'll have 667 cats on site. So we're all we're all planning. We're little squirrels right now, getting ready for uh, for cats and kittens. Thank you. Any comments or questions for Kristen on the monthly report? I have one question. Um, it looked like we made some progress with our field officers because I think we were yes. at our last meeting we were that was one of our shortages and so congratulations on that thank you yes. and because uh, that's serious because that really does affect our day-to-day -day communication in our community it does and and thank you for mentioning that because we have gotten the call we've got a record number of calls the last two months we've got our open call volume down to 500 which is actually pretty good we keep calls open uh, if we can't get people to answer the door, we have to keep the call open. So 500 is actually a really healthy number. Um, and thank you for mentioning that because our, our they have boogied this last couple of months and we brought on a lot of uh, new staff. And a lot of them are transfers from other departments or promotions, which means they already understand how PAC works, how Pima County works, so the training process has been quick. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we have friends with PAC up next. Tammy? I did mention at the subcommittee meeting last month, we did meet our goal for our campaign that we were in. Um, so we're moving on from there. I did put our newsletters over there for anybody that was interested. You may have one. Um, we have
kind of sponsored adoption alley at the Wolfstock where PAC did adoptions at an off-site event. It was a very profitable day for them as far as getting animals into new homes. They had, um, I believe it was four or five of the mature animals found homes that day, which was very exciting. And they did have to come back to the shelter once to bring more animals out to be part of that day. It was a great turnout. There was a lot of people there that was very um, <coughs> animal-oriented and very friendly. We will also be sponsoring as a gold sponsor for the Adopt Love, Adopt Local event that's put on by Paul in April, April the 13th. Thank you, Karen. So we will be at that event as well, taking Questions for Friends of Pat? All right, sorry. <laughs> Is that a flyer that you could share in our minutes or get posted for the April 13th event? Yes. I mean, just to make yes. sure that we have this, yes. so that everybody can share it and, and respond because it is a community wide event with so many partners who care about our animals. Definitely. I can get that in the That'd be great. And now we have a volunteer report. Quite <laughs> uh, now, we're trying to get the volunteers and staff more together. And the volunteers are now having four events this year. Before, we've only had one event. The last one we had was the Bear Canyon of uh, Yuri. And it turned out to be a good event. We had 35, 40 people come. Mm -hmm. We had several staff members come, and the volunteers appreciate staff being there. We have another big one, kind of, which is our, unfortunately, I only have this one now, but we can get more, our um, volunteer appreciation party. And the whole month of April will be dedicated to the volunteers, and India will be sponsored and they set every day um, about our volunteers. And then there will be a big party um, on Sunday, January, sorry, April 7th, and it's going to be at Westbound, I'm going to say Annex on Westbound, but we do this, these are um, on Facebook, and we will have more flyers, but we encourage the staff members to come, along with volunteers, we're expecting 200 people, and we want the board to come, so they can see what we are doing. Then there will be another event in April, or not in April, I'm sorry, sometime in the um, spring, out, which I don't know what it's going to be yet, and then another one in the fall. And we're hoping to get more staff and more volunteers to participate so everybody will get to know each other, not here at the shelter, but in a different atmosphere. Awesome. So the time and the place and the address will all be on the website for the volunteer dinner? Um, party, yes. Party, okay, yeah, for the party. Yeah. Okay, and if you're writing the whole board, we just gotta remember that it's gotta be publicly noticed because I'm sure we all love to be there and we'll probably form a forum, so we need to make sure that it's publicly noticed to make sure that we're doing that. So make sure you keep me posted. And I can try to get people to RSVP with- Yes, yeah, we are gonna try to get RSVP yeah. because okay. we are having food and we're trying food and, um, We'll have the better embrace it, of course, but we want to find out how many that's going to be important. Okay. Perfect. Any questions? All right. One more <laughs> uh, Okay, I'm not your most Facebook friendly person. So would you just make sure some of these yeah, things yeah. are on the website yes, or yes, I, I mean, I meant, yeah. not just you, but just a reminder to everybody that not everybody's on I Facebook. She's on the tablet outside. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> That's awesome. And also, that <laughs> yes. but also, if you need any donations or added food or <coughs> raffle items, I don't know what the plan is, but don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah, okay. let, let us know. Let us know. Go ahead. Okay. Any other questions on that? Okay. Then we'll go ahead and move on. We have got a presentation on the GS GIS mapping system and Sarah is going to go ahead. Just kidding. Just kidding Sarah. <laughs> I'm, going to do that. I'm going to speak later. 
Sorry, sorry, speak later. Do you want this? Yes, please. So can I interpret this really quick? We we asked the GIS department if they could get us down to a street level view of where all of our intake classes, adoptions, licensing, blah, 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 we're coming from. We can even show you where our volunteers live. Um, and so Bennett's going to walk you through some of this. Um, if you are a GIS nerd or you want to be, we can also um, share all of this. It's a it's layered map, so you, you, it's a little confusing. But so that's what GIS is, is mapping? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay Bennett, take, take over. So if this is sent out, we do get it. Um, to access the layers over here on the right side, there's something that looks like a bunch of layered sheets of paper. You click on that, if I can get it to come back up. Sorry. It's okay. Um, and then it, all the layers are going to drop down. It's under map frame, map layer. You can email me. Somebody can email. We'll send instructions. Um, so what's really awesome about these maps is it has allowed us to, to look at a few different things in a few different ways. All of these dots are um, intakes, adoptions, or something else. I Can everybody hear? Stop moving around. So Everybody's good? Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, let me know if I need to talk about that. Yes. Um, a bit. Okay, so these are all intakes, adoptions, pet support, fostered animals. It maps out everything so we can see where things are happening. Um, you can look at just individual intakes, it breaks it down by a lot of things. This map shows you volume. Um, some of these other maps show you different things. Uh, for example, this shows you certain items in relation to other ones and how dense that item is in that area. So if you want to see where a lot of our adoptions are going versus intakes, that makes it easier to compare. Which is which on this? Um, the Blue is the intake and the red is the adoption. Um, there's also heat maps on here. These are my favorite. Yeah, they show you the density of what, I apologize. Um, they show you the density of the item in comparison to the rest of the city. So these are our adoptions and you can see that there are mostly adoptions here in the center of the city and then up here. Um, when you compare that to, for example, intake, you can see where the difference is. Um, the intakes happen a little bit farther west and then in the south side. Um, so it gives you just a lot of information about where we need to focus our efforts. Um, it even breaks adoption down by cats and dogs, so you can see who, whether or not there's a trend in different areas, which there are. What's, um, the, what's the time frame of the data sets? 2018. Oh, it's just one Eight year. Two. We're looking at one, one year data. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I personally find it really interesting to, to compare them, but it's... Can you do the volunteer one? Is that going to yes. be complicated? No. There's just one other point I want him to show you. It's where our volunteers live. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. It's pretty stark. Um, you can see that we have most volunteers coming from the area around PAC, and I think that indicates we need to do more outreach to recruit volunteers. And, yeah. Do you have any questions about the maps? Well, the, the point is we have all this good data here yes. that we're working with. We're all not supposed to be brilliant today <laughs> with flipping through it. The point is we got it and it's part of our strategic planning and our, our yeah. program. The, yeah. the, we've never targeted services. We've always like had spay and neuter for you know low cost spay and yeah. neuters anyone in Pima County, mm -hmm. and vaccine clinics are just sort of like wherever we think we need them. Right. Um, so we're not doing. So moving forward, we want to do. We want to make those choices based on data, not just sort of our, what we feel is important. And so we're going to be renewing the spay and neuter contracts um, a year from now, and we're working with all of our spay and neuter partners. To say we either where what areas are we going to target services to? So if we know seven out of our 70s zip codes are producing 55% of pet intake, then we need to target spay neuter services in those seven zip codes rather than just saying anybody spay neuter. Yeah. So it's those kind of choices that are going to help us use our very precious resources in ways that have a higher impact on PAC. Um, but we wanted to show it to you today because it's early and we need, if there are people that have an interest in this, um, 
we, we need other experts at the table to help us interpret it and help us make choices, especially about things like volunteer recruitment, foster mm -hmm. recruitment, and things like that. So question, when you have your intake and you say it's mostly in the South, mm -hmm. are you able to tell um, if the dogs are altered or unaltered, or are they mostly unaltered? Or can you break that down on your intake? Okay, this method doesn't. We don't have that on this map, okay. but there are different types of intake. So for example, this is just straight. Okay. Um, and then you have- Strays, you said? Yes, this one is just strays. Um, you have returns, you have all the different intake types are broken out so you can see if there are trends in different areas. That's returns? Yeah. Fascinating. It's so interesting. Like, we don't know why that is yet. That's the next step is figuring out why our returns come from these hot spots. Well, and, and have you guys, you guys probably haven't had time to upload data from previous years. Not the GIS people already hate us, so I'm we're sure totally <laughs> waiting like a week to ask them. Yeah, because it'd be just interesting to see trend patterns um, year over year because one year doesn't really give you a good image of what that looks like. But it's great that we're getting it. It's super cool that we can see it this way. And I know um, one of the things that I would like to see them do is this is actually PDFs of maps, right? So they're not really like live maps. Right. Um, we're limited to what's in there, but to have the ability to access them live would be yeah. glorious. Yeah. yeah, very, very cool. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, ben. Thank you, ben. Any other questions on the mapping system for Ben or anybody else? So I guess the question I have, Madam Chair, and, and Kristen, where, where are you guys going with this as far as public accessibility long term? Because obviously this is a little bit too deep a dive. Are you guys thinking about how to produce some of these heat maps and things posted on the web page so that they're available that way for, for the public? Because, you know, the granularity of this can get really absurd. Yes, that's a really good question. When Sarah shows you the redone website, we'll yeah. show you how we're doing that already. Sweet. We're sticking our toe in the water a little bit on that. But yes, we want to figure out how to get these translatable to the public. Um, and I think we'll probably be, the first things that'll become translatable are the um, loss of compass. Yeah, absolutely. So. And I would also argue when the, when the resource discussion comes forward for people to understand how you guys are better allocating those dollars into those areas, especially on that spay neuter effort, those kind of things, I think there's huge value in that. Um, long term, certainly for the partner, you know, and donors. Yeah, okay. yeah. Lets them know that it. Because yes, when we did the prior to you getting here, when we did the licensing efforts, every ward office wanted one, right, to do this licensing outreach or this the, the, the free vaccinations or this kind of thing tied in. It was kind of like, but you don't have a problem in ward four. Yeah. <laughs> and the people that were coming in from from the outer wards, we were actually getting people coming in from across town or in other areas where it did match up because they, they were willing to drive that far to get those free services or, or make that happen, which was kind of shocking to see that. Hmm. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, when we do this breakdown of the surrender dogs or cats, there's a questionnaire that people fill out when they bring their animals back. Are you able to fill in the, um, find the most reasons for the specific areas when people bring them back? or is it too soon to break that down? We don't have that yet because JS hasn't processed that information yeah. for us. Okay. Um, but that would be the goal so that we know which resources are needed. Okay. So if you know one area is say medical assistance and one area is fencing like you know we we know what resources to offer in those areas. Thank you. The, the maps are capable of doing that. The okay. GIS data layers, we absolutely could do that. It's just, it's a lot of input and you right. gotta make sure you're getting it accurate. And so we use these um, for the city efforts that we did, uh, our Prop 407, the Parks and Connections Bond. Mm -hmm. We create story maps now. It's one of the biggest things we do. We have those for our for, uh, uh, mural program. We have it for this and we use the GIS layers to identify those spots. So there's a ton though of manual effort that has to go in to make it all flippable. and and exactly what you're talking about. It would be great to see what you're talking about. You know, we surrendered the dog because of inability to afford animal, ill animal. Uh, and, and you can click those layers and watch those shift within the structure. It, it's doable. It's just a question of time and resources and money. We'd like our own GIS person. Like that. <laughs> It'd be a full-time gig. That's awesome. Great.
great first pass at it. Thank Everybody. you. It's yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, animal protection update. And we have Veronica Sanders going Go ahead and give us that. Come over here. Veronica is one of our supervisors, and I heard her talk to our hearing officers and explain some of this to them, and I was like captivated. So she's going to talk specifically today about safety issues. So there's a million topics she could talk about, but you, had, you all had asked us to come address what happens when somebody makes a concern or complaint about safety, whether a dog attack or a human attack. So she's talking specifically about that today. Hi, I'm Veronica. So um, basically we have a set of protocols in place every time we receive a complaint about um, either a human that's attacked by another animal or an animal that's attacked by an animal. When it's um, an issue where whether it's human or dog or cat that is attacked and that animal is currently at large, we consider that one of our highest priority calls and an officer is immediately dispatched for that purpose. The first thing that officer would do was go out and make sure that the public is safe. Go and try and find the dog that's at large that potentially harmed a human or harmed another animal. Can find that animal. The next thing we would do on that call is go and meet with the victim. We even go to the hospital to meet with the victim. These calls can be very time consuming because we can drive all over the county to go and find the animal and make con uh, contact with the victim and then go and meet with witnesses and then ultimately, hopefully, find the owner of that animal and issue citations for restitution, so on and so forth. The only time a call where an animal or um, a human was attacked and it would not be considered an immediate emergency response would be if that animal is no longer at large. Uh, and it does happen. People will call us several days after an attack occurs. At that point, we don't come um, rushing out right away. Um, but it is our next highest priority call. It is considered a priority number two. An officer would come out on this complaint. The first thing we would do is make contact with the complainant, the person who was attacked, or the person who owns the animal that was attacked. We go, we get their statement, we photograph their animal or their injuries, uh, medical bills, vet bills, whatever it is that they might have, and we provide them with their options, and then we would go and attempt to make contact with the owner of the attacking animal. In either situation, although it's in our control to uh, meet with the complainant and speak to them and get all the information that they have to provide to us, the part where is, um, we are not in control of is trying to make contact with the dog owner, and that's always where the process breaks down for us. We are not post-certified officers. We don't have the ability to knock down people's doors and force them to talk to us. All we can do is show up over and over and over, and we do. We do not give up. We have one year during the statute of limitations, and we keep going. I've seen calls go as high as 25, 30 sequences, attempting to make contact with the owner of a, an aggressive animal for the purpose of getting that restitution for the injured human or the person who owns the injured or now deceased animal. Anytime we have a situation, uh, we have a bite scale. It's what we call it, a bite scale. If a human is injured um, to a certain severity, or let's say a domestic or even livestock animal is killed, uh, during the process of an attack, we have what's called a dangerous dog evaluation. All of our officers are well aware that any time we have a serious fight or a situation where an animal is severely harmed or killed, they have to report that to both their supervisors as well as our manager, Christina Snow. Each and every case is looked at. We have gone away with the automatic declarations, but it doesn't mean that we aren't declaring animals for killing other animals. It just means everybody's getting a score sheet. This way, it's just fair across the board how we treat it. Every animal gets a score sheet and gets declared based on a score sheet that's been set up by, I believe, county attorneys. And that's pretty much our process. So I know sometimes, uh, oh yeah, and I've got some um, <laughs> handouts for everybody. It can be time consuming, but it's, you know, like I said, we gotta just keep showing up until we make contact. So I have a question. Yes. What, um, what different levels do you have to say if you're level one or yeah. two? So a uh, level one, uh, a pri I'm sorry, are you talking about the bite scale or the priority system? Which priority priority system. Is okay. Uh, the priority number one is considered an emergency response. That means an officer is dispatched as soon as that call comes in, around the clock. It doesn't matter what time of day or night. If it's a holiday, it doesn't matter. If it's a priority one, officer goes out. A priority one attack would be if a person has been um, brought to a hospital with severe bite wounds. 
we consider that emergency. We need to go out immediately and find out, was this a mauling? Well, you know, um, might somebody lose a limb, require surgery, overnight hospital care? So anytime we're informed by Tucson Fire uh, or Police Department or Sheriff's Department that a person was removed from the scene in an ambulance, we go out right away and investigate that. Anytime an animal is killed, again, that's considered an emergency, immediately responds, we go out right away. Priority two would be the next level down. Those would be the calls where, let's say, somebody calls us a couple hours later or a couple days later, oh, my dog was killed by my neighbor's dog. That's a priority two. That animal is not currently loose in the, in the community. It is not currently a threat to public safety. Um, if somebody calls in and says, I was attacked by an animal, they didn't bite me, but they tried to bite me, but I got away, and that dog is still currently loose, that is still an emergency for us because that animal is still at large, and that's our number one goal is public safety. So if somebody reports an aggressive animal at large that just tried to attack someone, even if there was no breaking skin, we go out right away. If somebody reports an animal attack that resulted in serious medical intervention, even if the animal's not at large, we go right away because we have uh, you know, human life in danger. And even if that animal has been brought back in its yard, we need that animal to out of the community and at pack until we assess the situation, determine the severity of the human um, damage. So there's just two priority levels? Yep, everything, everything including a human attack or um, an animal on animal attack would be either emergency or level two. There are some instances where we might have a priority three that might be a human attack or an animal on animal attack. The only time we would drop a call down that low <coughs> is if um, somebody's calling in because they think that they saw a dog that lives across the street uh, went into someone else's yard and attacked that dog. We have awareness of a possible um, public safety threat, but until it, at that point it's just hearsay. We need to speak to the owner of that animal or the person that was attacked. We will still investigate that call. It will still get placed in our traffic for investigation. But unless we know for sure that a human was attacked or an animal was attacked or a human was almost attacked, um, we would not make that a one or two. Although, however, we will still investigate. How many priorities are there total? We have a total of five priorities, although priority five is not one that is a, an active working call. Those are our noise complaints, those are our waste complaints, animal uh, calls that don't involve um, neglect and that don't involve public safety it would be in five. So one and two are our public safety ones. Um, Anytime an a animal is in danger by another animal or a bite to a human or a mauling to a human, number three would start our neglect calls. We do, however, have neglect calls that rise to the occasion of a priority one, but that's, that's typically uh, how our system works. One and two is public safety, three and four is neglect, five is our uh, victimless crimes. I'm, you said that if they're the law answers the door, you can't, I know you can't break the door down, yeah. Yeah. but if there's neglect and the dog is outside, okay. can you take the dog even without them giving you permission? Absolutely, it's right. but there has to be exigency. Exigency means we must be able to articulate in the eyes of the law that we believed with our professional uh, experience that this animal was in danger of dying if we did not remove it. Otherwise, it is theft. Animals are considered property in the state of Arizona. So if I show up at somebody's house and I want to remove their dog because I think it's in distress, I better be able to uh, prove that in court, <laughs> convince the prosecutor and the judge that that is the case. Otherwise, I, I've just stolen somebody's pet. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that we have exigency. That basically means an animal has to be lateral. Um, they have to be truly in danger of dying right now. If I don't see it in, take it back. But Arizona did pass a law that if the dog is in a car that's closed in the middle of summer, you, yeah. can't break, if you can't get to the owner, you can't break in. And get that is car. correct. An animal on a tie-out and an animal inside of a turned-off car with closed windows is considered to be in immediate distress. And in those two situations, even if the animal is sitting there happy, wagging his tail, and he's looking okay, we do have the right to break the window and remove the animal, or we have the right to take the dog off the property on a tie-out. Okay. Even though the animal's not in distress, the only reason we remove animals from the tie-out as well as the yard is because we have to assume if an owner put an animal on a tie-out, it's because the animal can escape that yard. So we may not necessarily uh, cite somebody for that, but we will remove the animal because we can't leave it loose in the yard if it was on a tie-out. 
Um, are you 24 hours a day? Yes, ma'am. 365 days a year. You, you can always reach out to live person once Thank you. Any other questions? I'm going to give a kudos. So we had a, um, and I think you were out on that call, right? Like, weren't you for the gas leak? Was that you? Yes, yes. I thought it was you. We, <laughs> met, <laughs> yeah, we, met, yeah. we met late at night. Um, <laughs> uh, we really appreciated having you reach out to Kristen and getting with the dispatch and Veronica and one of our other teammates came out. Uh, one of our utility companies blew through Southwest Gas main on uh, Prudence. Yeah, it was like a seven inch main. It said gas flying in the air. Yeah, yeah, shh. Um, <laughs> might need it for a donation. See? Um, and and uh, one of the challenges with that is that you shut down the entire main to re-energize gas lines, even shut down lines, you have to turn off meters and then turn them back on. But the problem is, when this happens in the evening, early evening, late evening hours, most of those meters are in people's backyards. So we had about 13 customers initially that we couldn't get a hold of. Um, uh, one of the benefits now of serving on the PAC board is, is to, uh, I knew how to get a hold of everybody. And uh, you guys were able to come out, two officers came out, and largely were on standby. We were fortunate we did finally reach all the, uh, the homeowners that we needed to get into their yards. But um, learned a lot about what police officers deal with with that, what our Southwest Gas Utility people deal with with that, and what these folks deal with. Um, we had residents of homes on the east side of town, which you don't think of largely as a problematic area in many cases. Uh, threaten Southwest Gas employees with firearms uh, for coming on their property to keep them from blowing up. And we had to have TPD intervene in those cases. We needed these folks to get in the yards because a dog's going to be a dog. If you come over their wall, um, it's going to bite you. That's his job, right? Potentially or her job. Um, and so the goal was to have these folks be able to humanely restrain them so that we could get them out of the yard, the gas people in there to get those shut down because if they re-energize the line without checking those meters, kaboom. To the house material gets in there and travel mm -hmm. so great job thank you for being there i don't think you had to yeah. get any dogs it was incredible but, i couldn't believe it yeah. not one that's awesome yeah. so fortunately <laughs> but yeah. but we knew there were 13 and they were there within about 35 minutes and that was a huge wow. partnership in our community to make that work so thank you Absolutely. other cool thing is southwest gas really cared and they asked us if there was a way we could get a hold of someone to help with this mm -hmm. rather than putting the dogs at risk or mm -hmm. you know and mm -hmm. said can you get anybody besides tpd because they know the burden that that puts on our law enforcement as well. So it was great. Great job. Thank, Thank you. you. And I understand that a version of this is going to be available on the website. We're going to talk about that. Yes. <laughs> we're, going to website. we're going to try to do that. If you need a copy, let me know. Um, well, it's Ta da! It's a good transition. <laughs> it's a okay. Perfect. It's on the website. We did it. <laughs> Adam, I feel like I've been talking to you guys about the website for like months um, because that's how long we've been working on it. Um, so, if you remember, um, we had the we had the original website. Um, we determined that this was a point of a lot of frustration for people where they couldn't find what they needed easily. So we just sort of made this janky like. Here's all the things up at the top. Um, it was not really very eye appealing, uh, but it was functional. People could easily find things. Um, I've spent the last two to three months meeting with our web design team uh, to come up with this, which is not maybe how we all envisioned it being, um, but it's more than just functional. We spent a lot of time looking at data for what services are people calling PAC for, um, what services, what pages on the website are people going to, how are they getting to those pages, like where, what page are they on before they get here, and then when are they leaving our website, so what page are they either getting the information that they're looking for from, um, or are they getting so frustrated that they're done. Um, to come up with these categories and make it a lot easier um, and eye appealing. It's not finished, but um, it is much more functional, it's clean, uh, and it still fits within sort of these guidelines that the county sets for us. Um, one of the surprises that um, 
Eddie and James from our web design team did for me is I asked them at one meeting, I was like, can we have one of those cool scrolling banners like the county has on their homepage? And they were like, no, you can't. And then the next meeting we had one. Um, so we're, we're the only department that has this. And they were like, don't call anyone. Yeah. Because everyone will ask them, right? Oh, good, Sarah. Perfect. So, uh, <laughs> Um, uh, but we do have the option to, to now edit those um, as we need to, so it kind of fits in with like the strategic planning committee, um, the subcommittee, one of our things was talking about how do we amplify a particular message um, that we're focused on each month, and so now this is an additional tool. Um, the other thing that we got access to is um, what's traditionally been called like the newsroom. Um, this is where Nikki or our comms team will post their press releases, but we now have access to use this kind of as like a blog or a newsletter type format, an informational communication format, where it's not just limited to things that are getting sent out to media. Um, so again, another way for us to reinforce and amplify a message um, that we're trying to get out, as well as to stay in touch with people, let them know kind of what's going on for those that aren't necessarily on our Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, I don't remember if I've shown you this before, but we have a Google Calendar for PAC. Um, this was always an underutilized tool where there was just like a recurring once a month PetSmart adoption event on there. Um, so now we have access to this, and we're putting information on here about clinics, um, uh, adoption events, adoption promotions we're doing on site, um, partnerships, <laughs> things that we're doing off site with different commu uh, community partners. And this actually feeds into the county's calendar on the main county page. And the other thing that I wanted to talk about a little bit, which I think goes into some of the leash laws and things, um, is we outlined on the web page previously sort of what the process is, a noise complaint. Um, but we're now at the point that we're working on the forms, so things like this can be reported online, um, deceased animals that need to be picked up, um, noise complaints, a change in license status, which we had um, I, found, I just found out yesterday that we had a form before and it went away at some point um, so that people can say, stop sending me license notices, I don't live here anymore, um, or I don't have the pet any longer. Um, but again, trying to figure out how to make us more efficient and able to better provide services to people, get information from them. Um, now that the homepage layout is completed, the next step is for me to, and for Kristen, unfortunately, more work, <laughs> is to go through all of these subpages and really look at what's the, what's the content of this, how do we make it clear um, or update it. Uh, but I told the, the web team the next step for them is to work on um, the Adoptable Pets page. And if I remember correctly, maybe six months ago, we looked at some other shelters and kind of what they were doing. Um, other shelters that have chameleon, other shelters that um, are sort of limited by their, their county or their city that they are operating in. And how do we personalize the available pets pages, the stray pets pages, so that it has the same appearance for the county, but also it's an internal site where we now have control over um, Collecting, analyzing, I guess, the usage patterns, not really collecting data, but analyzing the usage patterns and figuring out how to make that um, easier and more accessible. Show the map. Um, the map. The map's changed a little since we showed it to you last time. We it's like my favorite thing happening. <laughs> helping people so much get their pets home. Mm -hmm. We're going to start, tra we're tracking data on whether our return to owner rates are increasing just from the snap. So, reds are dogs, blues are cats. Yes. So what we've added, what we've changed is we've made the um, legend for this so that it's on here all the time. Originally it wasn't. And then um, 
the other thing is if there's multiple, I don't know if I have any right now, but if there's multiple dots. They're found, they're, these are found pens? Yeah. Oh, their pictures pop up now. I, don't oh, I can't make that, that part any bigger. Let me show you. That's awesome. We got one with maybe a cuter picture. Kind of terrible looking. You dog stuff. There you go. Right. And I apologize, I can't make this bigger. Um, but what it has at the top is if if you have information, if you have questions, call us at the pet support number, and here's the nice. picture right away. And then if you scroll down, it goes into um, a little bit more information. Um, the date, the breed, the sex, the color. Um, originally, the picture was kind of at the bottom, and people didn't scroll for that. Um, and the other thing, I'm not sure if I can find one, but if there's multiple pets at the same spot, it would have like a little itty bitty triangle thing right here. Nice. Um, it wasn't very clear that there was another pet there, and so um, it should now be so that they both show. Um, Great progress. Yeah, so it, it's, again, not as fast as I would like, <laughs> but um, just the fact that it's it's consistently improving on a weekly basis has been really positive. First, let me say kudos that the license are online. That is wonderful to not have to come and stand in line to do license, even though I'm down here all the time. But I went on today to, to pay the license for my two cheese and it was just so easy on that home page to just go, oh, there's the license, let's go. Well, and it was done. Nice. And then I could do both of them at the same time. I didn't have to back out and go back in. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And one of the things that we did look at is, you know, a lot of the stuff on our home page is also um, a lot of the main links are listed on this right hand side, but if you're on like a tablet or a right. phone, that right hand column is not necessarily seen, plus it's um, because of the colors they chose, they don't really stand out. Um, so a lot of people miss that that's even a menu. Um, so there was some kind of pushback um, from the web team a little bit that, well you already have all of this stuff right here, um, but I think uh, the feedback that we've gotten has been really positive. Um, like Tammy's saying about being able to find things. And it's the categorizations for very logical set up. Yeah, that was very good. <laughs> that was challenging. Um, one of the things that I was, um, that we discovered also is a lot of the content that we want to have, we don't necessarily have yet. Um, so when you click on like spay, neuter, or microchips or vaccines, all of those right now take you to No Kill Cuba County's page because they have current mm -hmm. um, updated yeah. information. Um, so there's more stuff to be done. Thanks. Questions? Oh yeah. Well, I, yeah. maybe I'm not sure you can help me. I think this is fabulous because even I mean, I'm on Pack Act now. I, for years, I had a hard time in your site going finding something over and over again. Like from one month to the next, I had so much trouble finding it, and I've been using it for a long time. So this is going to be so nice. And I'm not sure if you're the person to ask, or maybe Nikki. I have friends who are my age, and they're not tech savvy, and they don't know to look at the website, and they don't know how to find things. And they want to know how they can find out more information from PAC without having to be tech savvy. And is there a way to get information out there that is not Twitter, is not social media, is not a website? How can people find things out without having a computer? And I know that is. Yeah, that, that generation will die off, but they're not dead yet. <laughs> <laughs> and they are supportive of They're very supportive. Yeah. Well, you know, I, 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 I want to answer that. I think that we, one of the things that we have been doing is looking at, Nikki and I are looking at, is if we do go ahead and do the blog, which I think we desperately need to do as we continue this community conversation about what we're all doing here and how we should be doing it, as we do the blog, we're gonna we I we are pushing to do a printed version as well. I don't think you're you're never gonna get this level of information, right. and I think most people use a website at least. Right. I think more people just aren't on social media, right. so we're trying to bump up the website. Most right. people can use those and get that blog as it's written then into a newsletter format. Um, okay. And we all of my I'm. I'm doing monthly blogs now that are going out on Pima County FYI, okay. which is a public-facing Pima County right. newsletter. So that's another way people can access information. Okay. 
we also redid the phone tree to get rid of some of the repetition. Okay. The word okay. stray was in the original setup like four or five times. And right. now we've set it to be just one location. Okay. okay. So we tried to make the phone tree easier to understand. Okay. And then I would say um, another piece that we're just starting to look at is um, doing postcards, mailers, um, getting connected with utility companies, like some of those things that um, we haven't utilized, but are additional non-electronic ways. Some of the recommendations from these people are that if you could post in the libraries, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if there's just, it, like the libraries always have a big posting of what's happening. Mm -hmm. around them, if you could post in the library, even yeah. like a newsletter drop them off in the library or have something available there that people can come in. If they're, when they're coming in, they still read books. If they're coming in, they can see it. So if I may, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. I, I'm glad you provided that, Jeff, thanks, because that was my concern, is where are they getting the information? Do we need to figure out a way to do some intercept surveys, you know, direct contact, and where could we do that, right. that you can identify where we can connect with these people? So look, the library, excuse me, the libraries would be fantastic um, in that it's a county facility, so it makes it a little bit easier for that. And I think Mark could probably help on that front. And they're so supportive of those kind of efforts, which is awesome. The other piece that could be kind of fun um, would be maybe to reach out to um, our local coffee shops and our Starbucks, because they always have the posted board. They tend to be hyper animal friendly. There's tons of stuff on there about that. And they might be willing to be a great community partner with us, both yes. our local coffee shops and that kind of thing. Just about everybody hits it. Everybody hits and it especially right. when you're talking about that demographic of that donor demographic, right. that that because you're you're absolutely right. Our biggest donor demographic is also our least tech savvy demographic, exactly. right? So that's yeah. always going to be the case with all of our donation items. So that's really brilliant. I was thinking that might be a great way to hit them. Tie in just about everybody I know at Starbucks talks about this kind of when you're there. So it's kind of cool. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Gary, did you have something? Um, oh, I just wanted to kind of touch on your point. When we had our call, um, uh, semi-annual meeting, we had a discussion about how to reach those individuals that, you know, don't use the internet, are in poverty level, they don't have a computer, they don't have a smartphone. And it's really interesting to say that one of the, the um, resources is to use the other organizations, like the fund, the uh, food delivery. Oh yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. Meals on wheels. Meals on wheels, and right. give them right. educational material, mm -hmm. flyers or whatnot, that they can hand to those that are not really right. going out and looking at things like this. So the food bank would be another. Place. Yeah. So just using other organizations that could possibly That's have a great idea. That they can, you know, we have the same problem. That's awesome. Um. We've been talking about so many great updates today and new information. Who do we tell thank you? I mean, do we shoot a note to our county supervisor? Do we send a note here? I mean, those of us who are really proud of what we're doing with our communications and our upgrades and our, our added team and our added volunteer satisfaction, I mean, who? how do we... I'm just throwing that out. Nobody has to answer right now, but I think we need to keep thinking, about keep thinking of the positives and how do we make sure people know that we're doing things right, or at least trying to. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Next. <laughs> Any other comments or questions? Okay. With that, we will go ahead and say thank you. Um, we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, the next topic is I'm going to go ahead. It's the resource challenged adopters. We've already heard a lot of comments on that today uh, from the call to the audience. Um, this was an agenda item that was brought to us by Gail. So I'm going to let Gail go ahead and start this. Um, and then we've already started to take some action on this. We want everybody to know that. I'll go ahead and let you know um, kind of what the, the game plan is as to how we're going to do this, and it really does kind of revolves around the volunteers, so you guys will all be interested in hearing where we're going next with this. But I'll let Gail go ahead and start. I don't want to repeat what's been said, because mm -hmm. this group of volunteers said it much more eloquently than I could ever put it together. Can you speak up so, Okay, I said I don't want to repeat what the volunteers have said, because you put a very, very eloquent spin on it. You spoke beautifully, and I know you spoke from your heart. And 
that's what the point of PAC is. It's about the heart. That's what the community voted for when they voted the bond. It was about coming from the heart. They knew what PAC was like since 1960, and they wanted to make a change. And that it was came from here. And to see a dog, multiple dogs, go out to somebody who can't take care of it after we brought it in, took it, taking care of it, and I know the staff works very hard at PAC, but the, a lot of the work with these animals is volunteers. They, they come in at 6 o'clock in the morning and they walk the dogs. Central Pet's cleaning up after the dogs. The, the, the vet team is taking care of the dogs. And people, everybody puts their heart and souls into these dogs. And then for these dogs to get adopted, and I know it was an admittedly bad adoption twice, but to go to an area where we just rescued them from, to me, is absurd. And I know community members that I've spoken to were very upset when we, and I, I took a poll just to see what people felt about it. Well, maybe I'm out of tune. Maybe I'm too close to the situation. Because I knew Blue very well. I had been walking him when his new owner came to get him. And I was in shock when I heard what was going on. And thankful that somebody gave him a phone number to contact him. And I won't say who, that if he needed help. And he did need help multiple times. So when I spoke to community members thinking, well, maybe this is an acceptable, appropriate thing, they were upset. Then I started reviewing the the county laws, the state laws, and a homeless person can't guarantee providing shelter to an animal. Uh, they can't guarantee it's medical care, it's vet care. And yes, we have wonderful outreach programs, but I don't think we want to add to the strain of that. I mean, Bennett works very hard with his outreach for the homeless. But to add to that is putting incredible strain, I think, on our resources. So that was why I asked to have this on the agenda. I know there are way better ways to handle our animals, get them into the arms of loving people, get them into the homes of loving people. So that was why I asked about this. I'm not going to talk about the heat of the summer. We discussed that. I'm not going to talk about the cold winter. I worked in volunteer places where we have Operation Deep Freeze where pets were not allowed in. They had to make other arrangements. A lot of these people wouldn't come in if they couldn't take their pet in. So they're freezing in a doorway because they wouldn't give up their pet, which shows you how wonderful and how much these homeless people love their animals, but I can't see adding to the stress of the responsibility of a pet to these unfortunate people. Um, so that was why I asked to have this on the agenda. Okay. What I talked at length with, with Gail about this and I've talked to Kristen about this. Um, this is going to be discussed in depth at an upcoming volunteer meeting with the volunteers. Um, they're going to bring in um, Peggy Hutchinson from Primavera Foundation um, to talk and so everybody's going to be able to, to get it. We're going to try to find a solution to this. Obviously, that's going to work um, for everybody. But we need to get, we want to hear every perspective on this too. We just, I mean, because we're all looking at this. Everybody's got a different angle. We want to make sure every angle and perspective is heard. So right now we're going to, we're going to kind of table this as far as PAC Act goes until we can have this, until this volunteer meeting happens and Peggy from Primavera Foundation comes in and gives her perspective on um, on the situation. What is the volunteer I believe they tentatively have it scheduled for the sometime the third week of twentieth of March. Twentieth of March, third week of March, twentieth of March. I wanted to say something. But Go ahead. Um, I, I want to say I really understand this issue and I understand I, I share many of the volunteers concerns I think it's really it's sort of like the pinnacle of the question of who's good enough to own a pet and it's a really critical community conversation and I, from a personal standpoint I don't really know where I stand on the issue because not uh, to lump homeless people all into one category of human beings and, every, and to imagine what all those circumstances are like seems to close doors I don't know that we as a community want to close I'm not a subject, subject matter expert on homelessness in this community, um, and 
I thought Peggy, I thought um, Peggy Hutchison would be a good person to help us have this conversation because we need a policy that makes sense. And it's easy to just close this door, and it's also easy to close the door on outdoor adoptions, which we do here. Um, we adopt dogs to outdoor-only homes. Um, the dog that was in question, actually, the owner did provide an address, um, the one that, that sort of brought up the discussion. This owner did have an address. They wouldn't have even fallen into this category. So it's, it's a more complicated issue, I think, but I, I want the volunteers to hear that I don't, I hear everything that, that they're all saying, because it is, we, we all love these animals, and I think we're all here because we love them and want the best for them. And, and we really do need to think as a community, A, who is good enough or has a set of circumstances that makes them okay to adopt, and B, for those, we are always gonna do adoptions that we feel like are at-risk adoptions. Like for me, it's people I know are gonna take the dog home and just leave it alone, like all day by itself. To me, that, that is just, it sounds terrible. And so what we're going to do is how can we provide better support following adoption so that to make those by people better pet owners. So I think the the I'm I'm in, I'm looking forward to the conversation as a learner, not a speaker. I don't think that my opinion is the expert opinion on this. Um, and I don't know really where I stand on it. So I think that conversation is going to be really productive and I, I hope I hope we as a community can truly come up with something that doesn't just slam a door to every X but also does not have dogs going places where they are not going to receive proper care, because I didn't think any of us want that. Okay. Yes, yeah. The adoption that we've discussed that got this ball rolling, I know that the person provided an address, but the person who was giving the dog, who, the adoption counselor, knew the man was homeless. Because I brought the dog up for a walk, and she said, oh, he's good. I said, oh, who's adopting him? Oh, a homeless man. So they knew that he had an address to drop his brothers or his brother, somebody would drop in, but they also knew that he did not live in that home permanently. So there's a lot of confusion in that adoption report. Um, may I make a motion, and I'm not sure if we're allowed to say this, or make an advice that PAX does not adopt to someone without an address until we have a decision? Since we're having a meeting in a week, can you do that? I mean, because you're not, a homeless person is not providing shelter, which is in the county code, which is the code. You've got right above my head. I don't know if I can do that. So the code is shelter, water, and food, and medical care. If someone doesn't have an address, they're not providing shelter. Shelter, so, Madam Chair and Gail, I totally hear you, and, and I get this. This is, this is tough because this is a situation, that I, and, and I appreciate everybody who came out, and clearly your hearts are, are very committed. And, you know, without you, this place doesn't even operate the, the way it does. So so it's huge. So we know that. The, I wish we had an attorney present for this because the, the issue would be how the county law with the code works. Shelter can mean a lot more in the law than a house. Yep. That's the challenge. Um, and. Homelessness can be looked at the same way disability can be looked at in some cases or other low income issues. And um, I only know this through my limited experience working with our city attorneys. So I, I'd, be, I'd be nervous supporting that motion right now just because I don't know if we're getting sideways of, of the law and any type of strange lawsuit that could be brought forward because of that for the sake of, of the board and for the county. Um, that said, um, you, you know, a, a clear message to those adopting volunteers that we we need to be really careful or even we bring in you know a director level or a supervisor level on this for those type of adoptions might be the more appropriate thing so that it isn't just staying within the volunteer and and whatever lower level staff. I don't know how it works folks so forgive me and for the short term so so that might be an issue where, where the, the supervisor comes in and can be help make that decision with that adopter counselor who's doing that to say, oh, we're gonna we're gonna wait on this. I mean, if Kristen went into that meeting and said, we really want to consider this, but we're a little concerned about your ability to care for this animal. So let, let's let's hold it another week. Let's have, I don't know how that would work, Kristen, but that that would be kind of my hope for that um, until we can get an answer on that. Um, yeah. Um, can I answer? Yes. I I will commit to all of you that anyone that's that we do not feel can provide a, 
provide appropriate shelter for an animal, we will say no to. And I want to say, without any, like, I want to make it very clear that we do say no to adopters. We do have a do not adopt list. And we will say no. And if any of you are ever involved in an adoption that you don't think the animal is going, I, I wrote this in an email to volunteers the other day. If anyone here thinks that they are participating in an adoption where the animal is going to be subject to cruelty, neglect, or abuse, that goes to my level. I want to know that. I check my email about every five minutes, about 22 hours a day. So please, those, those kind of communications should come directly to me because this is not truly about people facing homelessness. This is about those adoptions that were like, this is not a good fit, this is not the best choice for this animal. And I, I don't actually think this conversation is just about this. And, right. and we have to have a process and take very seriously when we feel animals are going to bad situations. And I don't think we've always done that. I think there was a time at PAC where we said, you know what, we just can't say no. It's gonna seem like, you know, we have something against this person, and and that just isn't true. There's there's nothing, but I do I do think there there are potential legal consequences to um, requiring a permanent address that we need to better understand. I'm going to be doing my due diligence to understand that. But in the meantime, if we feel like there is an adoption uh, where the animal is not going to get adequate care, it will come directly to me, and I'll be the one to approve or say no on that. Then can I ask that we? with the county attorney what the legality is we, we have to say that we are being consistent with what county and state laws are adoption process yes okay. yeah may if i may madam chair and gail to that point there may be case law that clearly identifies what that shelter aspect means and that i just don't know what it i means. could i try to find it i could find yeah it. well a lot of times we won't be able to because it's really buried okay. in lawsuits or things like that and okay. they the, the attorney will know they can track that and know where that citation may exist okay. or do some quick research whereas we just don't have that at our fingertips it gets really lost in All the right. case loads thank you and then just the other background, uh, the introduction of Peggy, uh, Peggy Hutchinson. Yes. I don't know if you all know her. No, Primavera. But she's Peggy. run Primavera here in town for at least 15 years. She's a leader in the country in understanding all of these issues. So I think to be able to have her with us is a, a fabulous, uh, it, it, it adds such depth. It's not just a Yahoo coming in. It is, I mean, it's truly... Uh, the heart of the, the issue and the knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I, my takeaway from this so far is that we've got a little less than seven days, or about seven days before this meeting that we're going to meet with, that Peggy's going to be there, um, and everybody's going to be able to discuss it. And within that week's time, if there's any questionable adoptions that you don't feel comfortable with, they're going to go straight to Kristen. So that's how we're going to deal with those until we can move further along in developing a, a POS on this. Um, did I say that acronym correctly? Yes, and always okay. if anyone ever kills okay. any animals. Yes, yes, okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I knew I did. Ah, sorry, I'm so sorry. sorry. Yes, yes, yes. I came out and I'm like, that's wrong. The OS is just point of sale. There we go. That's so key on this <coughs> until we can develop yeah. that yeah, for the next yeah. week. Yeah. If you have any yeah. questionable yeah. adoptions at all, yeah bring them to Kristen um, and she'll make the, the decision on, on how we're going to handle those for those for that interim time being. I just so since that's going to be done some of the dogs that different volunteers are working with whether in a top dog program or one of those other programs that may be a behavior dog um, we've, been, we've been speaking with adoptions and they are flagging those dogs so that if they, those dogs do come up for adoption they're advocating is, is listed yes. and can be called. So that may be another point of, of information for you oh, that may not be in Camellia. Mm -hmm. And I would say this extends to all the animals at PAC, not just, I don't want to just single out the dogs, no, no, I love no, the cats right. too. Yeah. So let's be aware when we're, with all of the adoptions, cats and dogs, so if you're uncomfortable with any of them. If I may ask Madam Chair, is it possible to have Peggy come speak at the next actual meeting to us as well? So that that's kind of a public thing. Can we check with Peggy and see if she'd be available? Because that'd be just a great conversation for the community to have as well after the volunteers have that opportunity first. Because clearly the direct impact is on the volunteers and on your operations. So to delay that until we have a public meeting here. But I do think it'd be a valuable conversation to kind of have on the record. Yeah. That might be really good for the community members who can't attend that volunteer yeah. meeting to have that chance. Of course. That'd be great cool. Because she is, she is phenomenal and she does understand the issue. I'm sure she's got a lot of data on this kind of. Yeah. Okay.
Okay. Let somebody know if you plan to go to the volunteer meeting. Just because there's procedure, quorum. yes, because there's procedures we have to follow, we're going to do a quorum. So. Okay. You said it was March 20. It's the 20th. So, like I said, I just and you don't have to let me know right now. You don't have to make a decision, but just let me know or let Mary Ellen know or just to let somebody know so that we can get a count. So that if we do, if we're running into that quorum area, that we can go ahead and get that noticed. Okay. Any other comments to this, or are we okay moving forward from this now until 20th? Okay. Um, we're going to do the award presentation now, so we're going to let Nikki go ahead and right. take over here. Right. Okay. okay, so I want to start with the volunteer that is here right now, um, Ruthie Esbeck Nardgang. Yeah. Yes. And I want to read to Stan and Liz before I grab you. Ruthie has been with PAC for about nine months. She's one of the most positive volunteers we have. She's very sweet, upbeat, and has always has something nice to say about everyone. She helps out in the clinic, the decompression program, and does massage on the pets. We are very lucky to have her here at PAC because she's a friendly person. That's wow. what was written about her. <laughs> and the other two folks aren't here, but I definitely want to read their uh, their uh, nominations yeah, as well. Yeah. So Claudia Polch, am I saying that right? Okay, a uh, super wonderful volunteer who helps in the clinic with all sorts of duties and tasks. She's always there to assist in any way that she can. Claudia has been with PAC for about seven months and is a great asset to the clinic and shows how comfortable she is in that environment. Um, and then Shari Mullen, Shinkoff, Sherry, Shari, Sherry, Sherry Mullenkoff, uh, Shar, Sherry. Sherry is a busy lady. It's spelled Shari. Sherry has been with PAC for about six months and jumps right in where needed. She helps to decorate the shelter during the holidays and the events. All the events. She's done that too. Side note. Uh, she assists with the pups, Pup and Boots program and filling the pantry. She is one of the volunteer leads who runs community groups and Sunday fun day, Sunday family fur days at PAC and attends many of our events to make them successful. She is a go-getter and we'd be lost without her. Got to get the exciting picture. Yes. No oh, yeah. oh, perfect. <laughs> Are you ready? One, two, three. Oh, All right. Wait for more. <laughs> Thank you. You're good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next agenda item is the call to the audience procedures. I'm going to be honest, this was left on there, but it was not actually an agenda item. That's why it's so new business and not old business. Uh, but I, what I will say about that is that we are going to post that um, by the door and or by the sign up sheets so that when you get here you guys will they'll be posted and I will have extra copies for the first next couple of meetings so everybody has those. They're not meant to be restrictive, they are just meant so that everybody's treated fairly. Um, and the time limits on this is standard. I'll be very honest with you. Those procedures were taken directly from other procedures that have already been written through the city and the county. I didn't make any of those up myself. Those are all just how other boards do their call to the audiences. So again, they're not meant to be restrictive. Um, if you have a special request to speak louder, please, ever longer, let me know. We'll what we'll do is we'll consider it for an agenda item instead of a three minute call to the audience at a future meeting. Okay, but I have to treat everybody fairly with the call to the audience and I apologize if anybody's offended by that, but everybody gets three minutes and I can't let, I can't cut one person off or and let another person run longer. I cannot have people that have taken the time to make sure what they need to say, they get it all said in three minutes, but then, you know, and penalize them when there's more they could have said, but they've taken the time to make sure they, they condense it down by letting some, you know, I can't penalize them by letting somebody else 
run well over time. I have to treat everybody fairly. That's part of my job. Um, again, if it's something that's very important to you that you feel you must go over that three minutes, let us know ahead of time and I can possibly, like I said, make it an agenda item and let you go ahead and speak differently. Call the audiences are more impromptu. I just really got to get this off my chest. They do have to be held to three minutes. That's where we're going with that. And like I said, they follow the procedures of the rest of the county. So um, you can go ahead and stop me privately if you want to discuss it further than that. But right now, we've, we've drafted them, we've voted on them, we've passed them, and I will have them posted um, at future meetings so that you can all have a copy of them if you like. Okay? Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, as, as Marcy did bring up, and since it was agenda, we can still discuss this. So, yes. Um, Marcy had a really good point that, that is challenging just because we haven't no fault of, of Mary Ellen's in any way, shape, or form. Getting the agenda out a little bit earlier would help inform that ability to know what's on the agenda um, and, and get it online so that someone could come to call the audience to provide information in advance of that agenda item as happened today. Every the, the, you know Everybody wanted to speak to this, knew it was coming, and sent you prepared statements. So that's a really good point, and it, it, it just puts incumbent upon all of us, if we have an issue, to get it to Kristen and, and Mary Ellen early to get it on, on the agenda and to try to get that up um, in, as, as far in advance as we can to allow that to occur for people who want to speak. I'm not, I'm not talking. And I just further comment to that. They do come out late because we do, I would like to give people as much Understood. time as possible yeah. to get agenda items yeah. to me. Otherwise, we're posting them, pulling them down, posting them, <laughs> revising them. Um, so that it's kind of a strategic, we're trying to get the timing correct on them so that we're not confusing everybody and there's not four versions of that agenda out there at any given time. Right. So, which happens quite often and right. then it gets really confusing. So, um, but again, I always feel free to try to get a hold of me um, if you need to speak longer than the three minutes and we'll, I'll do whatever I can, do my best to accommodate that. So, um, with that, if there's any other comments on that, Okay, then we'll go ahead and move on. Um, committee announcements. Does anybody in the committee have any announcements? Okay. Um, subcommittee. Are there any subcommittee announcements? If not, the only thing I'm going to ask is that um, subcommittees, we're going to try to meet before the next meeting, and that um, the subcommittee lead for each one has something prepared to say right. anything or something, an update of some sort on each one of the, the subcommittees. Now since the subcommittees are open meeting, mm -hmm. where do we, how soon do we have get our agenda, Mary Allen, and our place of meeting so that it can be posted? Mary Allen. Two days. Two days ahead of time. Okay. Yeah. So two days ahead of time. They're going to be very simple agendas, I'll be really honest. Right. It's going to be the call to order. Mm -hmm. It is going to be the adoption of the minutes, if we've kept minutes from the last one, the call to the audience, and then subcommittee business. So just so everybody knows, that's pretty much what the agenda is going to look like. Um, and unless you want to add more to that, to be more specific, we're going to try to keep those very simple. Um, so there is not a April PAC Act, Act meeting. Right. Right? right. So our next official meeting, as we know it, is in May. Just so everybody yep. knows, we're going every other month now. Yes. So it will be May. Yes, May 9th. Um, and the other thing I'd like to say about the subcommittee meetings, they're, they are going to be ran like these meetings. They're going to be publicly noticed. The public can come. They will have the three-minute call to the audience in, incorporated into them. But then they're not, it's not an interactive meeting where the public gets to actually sit at the table with us and join in as if they were part of the committee. It's again an audience type situation with the subcommittee, so they're run just like this. And the, um, the audience does not get to interject and make comments at the subcommittee meetings any more than they would at this meeting. So I need to be clear about that. Um, any other comments on the subcommittee meetings? I have a question. Yes. Do I have to email everyone? Okay. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll go. We'll. We'll. I will go ahead. And the actual procedures for the subcommittees. We'll. We'll talk about all of that to make sure we're not in violation of any. Um, any of the. The rules. Um, okay. Anything else on the subcommittees? Okay. Um, chair, that's me. Just get agenda items to me. Get them to me. Try to get them to me early. The earlier they all get to me, the earlier I can get the agendas out. Um, so that's the only announcement that I have. Um, and then the shelter needs and volunteering opportunities. Do we have any thing there? Yeah. Um, we are trying to recruit more volunteers for our play group at the Cal Enrichment Program. We have a play group training coming up for the volunteers, so hopefully we can get more people to assist with that um, at the end of this month, and we're setting up a, a training for more at Cal Enrichment. That way we can have volunteers doing those things to help support the behavior team. Great. Okay. Does anybody have any agenda requests right now? Campus won't put um, the at risk adoption on the agenda for. I've already got that. Yep, yeah, that's that's going to be on the next agenda. So we're going to have the, the volunteer oh. meeting and then <laughs> follow up at the May 9th meeting on that. Okay. Any other questions and comments? Okay, I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yes. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thanks. So. Okay. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank, Thank you, volunteers. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.